Hello and welcome to Motor Week. On this week's programme, Glenda Mackay has a load looking test for the new Rover 75 Estate. Richard Hammond drives the latest offering from the Proton Stable, the new Impian. Plus, we'll be looking at two four wheel drive rally monsters, the original Audi Quattro and the Mitsubishi Lancer. If you're a car manufacturer, embarking on producing a new estate car for over £20,000, then you've got to make sure that you get it spot on. Because for that much money, you can get one of the top three cars in the field, the Mercedes C, the Saab 9.5, and the formidable Volvo V70. And this is the new kid on the block, the Rover 75. Now, we already know that the Rover 75 saloon was a winner and helped keep Rover alive. But we also know that there's more to an estate car than making the back square. There's a certain question of style and handling and the big eye for image. Yes, even estate cars have to deal with the image thing. No longer can you drive a car and remain anonymous. They all say something about you. And Rover are hoping that this estate model will say something about one third of all Rover 75 buyers. Now the interior of an estate car is almost more important than that of a saloon. Why, you might be asking? Because the chances of many, many motorway miles with barking dogs, screaming kids, piles of boxes and nagging partners is very, very high. So you don't want a poor cabin to add to your stress. Identical to the 75 Saloon, Rover have done a great job in here. Don't think that the flimsy, slightly tacky interiors of the smaller Rovers have been emulated. This cabin is worthy of a Jag. Very stylish, very well put together and very well equipped, if a little oldie worldy. Now, personally, I prefer the interior of the MG ZT. Same layout, but no fake wood, no cream dials. It's all aluminium and graphite. Or maybe it's just that I'm too young and trendy to appreciate fake walnut. This car is the 2-litre CDT, with an on-the-road price of £20,700 for the basic model. But I've got four grand's worth of extras on this one, including add-ons such as sat-nav, rain sensors, sunroof and a rather nifty parking aid. Now for me, diesels and estates go pretty well together because high mileage means you need good fuel economy. And with this two litre diesel engine pulling up front, you're getting a mile to the gallon return into the late 40s, which is pretty good. Now this isn't the most rapid diesel car I've ever driven. And combine that with the fact that it's got an automatic box and the pull away is really quite sluggish. But once you're up and running, it's all right, and the gear change is very smooth, very refined. Engineered for comfort, it is great on long journeys and makes a fantastic motorway cruiser. And whilst you wouldn't want to push it too hard on windy country roads, it still remains reasonably composed and shouldn't have any backseat passengers hurling their lunch into the glove box. In the style stakes, I reckon it's another success for Rover. The 75 Tora does look classy without seeming dated. All the panels roll together nicely and the estate back doesn't look like an afterthought. The external chrome trim is a nice touch, as is this separate boot hatch when you want to throw things in in a hurry. But what about this boot space? I mean, after all, that is why you buy a car like this. I mean, it's all very well having underfloor storage and securing hooks, but how much gear can you get in here? Now, Rover quote this car as having 1,222 litres of space when the seats are down, but I reckon that litres should be reserved for wine bottles. I mean, what does that mean? So, I've devised a simple test to illustrate just how much space there is in there. The crew that we use carry loads of gear. In fact, they carry loads and loads and loads of gear. And their usual mode of transport is the trusty Ford Galaxy. Not particularly refined, but it gets all their gear and the lads from A to B no problem at all. So what we want to know is how much of their gear 
can they fit in the trusty Rover 75? Now that is very impressive and it's obvious that the Rover engineers have been very clever in maximising the amount of space available in here. So there you have it, the new Rover 75, a very competent, very stylish estate car and another huge feather in Rover's cap. And flying the flag for Britain, it makes you proud to be British, doesn't it? No! Oh, no! It's only a Proton. Exactly! You go to America, drive a Lexus. What do I get? A Proton. Thanks. If you do the test, I've got some fan mail for you. Honestly, it'll be alright. It's a nice car. Yeah, right. Come on, mate. It's a Proton, Rob. No, I promise you. Proton. Proton. You go to America, Lexus, big expensive cars. I just get cheap cars. Ah, the Proton Impian. Well, it could have been worse. In Malaysia, where it's made, it's called the Wadger. I mean, can you imagine it? Here, fancy a look at me Wadger. I'm just off to the garage, darling. It gotta get me Wadger out. I mean, Wadger. The Impian actually replaces the Weera, and ta-da! For the first time, this car has been entirely made by Proton. Yep, they did it all themselves, designed and built everything. Even use their own pencil. So bearing that in mind, they've actually been very sensible, very restrained. My response to being let off the leash like that would be to go completely nuts. Scoops, spoilers and probably tail fins would sprout like spots on a teenager's chin. And here's another important piece of this particular automotive jigsaw that I haven't yet shown you. Because underneath this, well, car body, a certain well-known sports car manufacturer of British origin has been allowed to go a twiddling and a tweaking. Lotus. This, though, is not the first time that Lotus have had a hand up a Proton's frog. The sparkly little Satria GTI boasts Lotus underpinnings, and that goes like a scalded ferret down a sprinter's shorts. It is quick. So what about the slightly more grown-up and serious Impian? Well, it's not bad. You can definitely feel that Lotus have been involved. It's a pretty firm ride. The steering is really, really nice, very direct. The brakes are well up to the job. There's plenty of grip. The seats are perhaps a little bit firm. And then there's the engine. And well, I've told a bit of a porky. Because the Proton Impian is entirely the work of Proton apart from the engine, because that is still an old Mitsubishi unit. 1.6 litres, 102 brake horsepower, and a bit flabby around the edges, really. Next year, though, there'll be a Renault 1.8 litre version, and the year after that, there'll be a Lotus and Proton combined work engine. That should be a lot better. Wait for that one. This car is in fact so important to Proton that I, nobly, went all the way to Malaysia to talk to their head man about it. No, I did. Malaysia, me, beaches, everything. It was fantastic. Morning, Milo. Thanks Morning. for talking to us. Hi. Can you just first of all explain to us the relationship between Proton and your government? Because it's unlike anything we'd understand in the UK. Okay. Well, basically, Proton is part of a plan to industrialize Malaysia. As you know, uh, 20 years ago, we're basically an agricultural country. And um, if you look at from the point of view of commodities, prices were always dropping. And we had to balance our economy. And uh, automotive was picked up as the industry that could not only provide jobs but start small and medium scale industries and yet at the same time acquire technologies. And from that point of view, Proton was set up to do those two things. You are now what you would call as a clean sheet manufacturer yeah. with the Impian as you're marketing it in the right. UK. You can start afresh. That must feel very good as a company to reach that point. Well, um, it certainly is very good. Uh, to, to my engineers and the people who've been behind this project. But I think it is 
more important for Malaysia because it, it sorts of signals are coming to age from um, the plan that we had, which is the ability to acquire and manage technologies. So Impian is the finished product of that, of that process. Um, I mean, we're very happy that we've now got a position where we might be able to compete on almost an equal ground. Back to Earth, there is one small fly in the ointment for Proton, or a couple of nub ends in the beer can of their hopes in fact, and that's that the Impian has a lot in common with a certain other sports car, the Aston Martin. Well in the Aston Martin, what you get is a kind of hand-built feeling, quality, everyone's different. In the Proton, well you don't want everyone to be different, and they are, quality, consistency, it ain't there. If you get a good one, great, if you get a bad one, whoop. Hang on though, I'm nitpicking. This is a proton. A bit like criticising a tramp for having dandruff, isn't it, really? I mean, it's got a wheel in each corner, it keeps the rain off, and it costs a bit more than a packet of breakfast cereal. What do you want for nothing? And so we must talk money. Proton aren't selling this on budget pricing alone. It starts from 12,000, rising to just over 13. The Impian is actually quite impressive for two reasons. Firstly, the fact that they didn't go berserk. Given free reign to do what they wanted, the Malaysians could have gone balmy, but they didn't. It's conservative, it looks positively German. And secondly, well, there's just the fact that it is an impressive car. It works well, it does all the things you want of a car. The handling's good, the ride's good, it looks good inside. Sure, the build quality isn't that of a Mercedes, but look at the price. Proton are the first to admit that they're not exactly a high-profile brand. But that's good. When Skoda tried to turn themselves around, they had to overcome a million jokes at their expense. Proton, well, their worst problem is not many people have heard of them. Great, it's a new market to educate. And if they keep knocking out cars like this, good luck to them. That's it for part one, but after the break, we've our four-wheel drive rally test, and Ian Royal has a used car tip for us in the shape of the Peugeot 106. You can just have too much luxury, you can be too pampered, you can enjoy too many comfortable cosseted rides over comfortable country roads in your comfortable cosseting luxury executive car. When sometimes all you really want is to actually feel the road beneath your wheels to get raucous in a car. So for today, you can keep your luxury. Paint it matte black and it's a stealth bomber. Some would say it's the granddaddy of them all. A few stickers and a roll cage and you can go rallying. But it's 20 years old, so what's it going to be like today? Well, you're not going to be fooling anybody inside or out that this is a modern car. Oh yeah, dated, straight lines. It's the 80s. They know how to make four-wheel drive. They still make some of the most sophisticated four-wheel drive systems in the world. And you can tell that this was the precursor to that. Sure, there's the old 
creak and the odd grinding noise, mostly from the interior shifting about, then it feels as tight as a drum. And that four-wheel drive system and that lovely talky engine still bellows and screams. This still feels like a fast, clunky, chunky, raucous car. It's exactly what I needed. This was just the piece. One of these. <laughs> I think so. So if this was the ultimate piece of four-wheel driven hooliganery in the 80s. Now you're talking. Just call me Mr. Bishy in it. £130,000. Now, go on, go and buy your Ferrari, and then I'll overtake you. <laughs> this thing has got to be amongst the most preposterous things on the road. Let me just remind you of those figures. Just remember, 0 to 60 for one and a half seconds. Thank you. 280 brake horsepower event. A top speed of 100 and oh, God knows what. This is one thing that it does incredibly well. Hold on. <laughs> Accelerating. Second, third, it just keeps going. Dragging the horizon. <laughs> The important thing to think about here is how much you're going to have to pay for this kind of performance. Back when it was new, the Audi cost £33,000. A lot of money, but it's still a hot performer even today. But if you want Ferrari beating performance, then the Mitsubishi Evo 6 at £28,000 gives a lot of dash for your cash. These cars are not designed to be romantic. They're machines for going as fast as possible. So I'm not about to go all misty-eyed about how the old stager is somehow better than the newcomer. Cos it ain't. Not by a long way. The Mitsubishi Evo 6 is undeniably fantastic. But you've still got to respect the Audi Quattro for its part in over two decades of four-wheel drive, bad attitude cars. With running a car getting more and more expensive, you might want to look at ways to save yourself a bit of money. Buy a smaller car that has a smaller engine, is more fuel efficient. And with reduced taxes on offer from the government for cars that pollute less, it could be something on the used car market that you're after. Perhaps like this. The baby Peugeot, the 106. Now this is one of the early examples from the range first introduced in 1991. So you'll find those early examples on something like a J-plate and they run through until 1996 when the 106 underwent a fairly major facelift to make it a much smarter and more refined small car. However, these early 106s are good cars, cheap to buy and insure. We're talking insurance group three for this 106 XM. And because of that, they make either ideal city cars for nipping around town or as a first car for a teenager. That is, as long as you're not over six foot tall because the interior is a little on the tight side. Not too much headroom there and pretty cramped for rear seat passengers as well. Equipment level on these base 106s is also pretty limited to be honest, so look out for one of the many special edition models like this for those nice little extras like, well, a sunroof. On the road, like most Peugeots, the 106s are also good to drive. The steering is sharp and precise, the brakes are good, and they're just such easy cars to manoeuvre. Now, a one-litre engine producing only 45 brake horsepower doesn't sound a lot, and it isn't. 
So these cars do tend to struggle when they're laden with extra luggage or even extra passengers. So you might want to look at one of the many other engine options available in the 106 range. So what sort of money should you pay for a 106? Well, something like this on a K reg with 68,000 miles on the clock would set you back about 2,000 pounds. An M reg 1.3 rally with 60,000 miles, about 3,500 pounds. And the top of the range 1.6 XSI on an N plate starts to look a bit expensive at about five grand. If you fancy a diesel, well, go for something like, say, an N plate 1.5 graduate diesel which would set you back again about £3,500. Now the key to these Peugeots is small car at a smallish price. Most 106s are in the price range of about £1,500 through to £4,000 and there have been no major problems since the car was first introduced if you can live with these rather silly little door handles. This is my used car tip this week, the Peugeot 106. Well, that's it for this week's programme, but on next week's Motor Week, we have a motor show special from the daddy of all motor shows, Frankfurt. We'll see you next week. <laughs>